Pásztor. Tehát küzdött. So every amazing kind of a circuitous route as a clinical agent. In 1914, it was synthesized by Merck in Germany, quickly fell into obscurity. In the 1960s and 70s, it was sort of rediscovered by the psychedelic community. Um, and then additionally began being used as an adjunctive tool in psychotherapy. Therapists nicknamed it Adam because they felt it brought patients back to a more primordial sort of uh, innocent state. And it was praised for being an ectanogen, which they described as being a drug that could increase relatedness, openness, and a sense of communication. Additionally, around that time, it rebranded itself by the much more sort of on the nose, sensationalistic name of ecstasy, and became very popular in the underground scene. And in 1985, of course, as they do with all fun things, it was scheduled once um, in the war on drugs. Subsequently, even though at that time there was a number of prominent universities that were submitting FDA applications to actually do randomized controlled trials, they rejected all of those. And it wasn't until 1992 when Dr. Grove, then at the University of California, Irvine, actually successfully uh, put in an application for the use of MDMA phase one clinical testing, looking at it in the treatment of depression and cancer patients. In 2002, they liberalized many of the rules on clinical trials with MDMA. Additionally, it continued to flourish in the underground scene, which we almost said honestly at the time with the rave and electronic dance music culture of the 1990s, but sort of fell out of favor after the product became very degraded in a lot of um, inappropriate sort of lethal contaminants became the norm. 2017, the FDA declared that MDMA was a potential breakthrough therapy for PTSD. Uh, additionally, it entered phase three clinical trials, and it, again, it rebranded itself in the early 2000s by the name of Molly and enjoyed a resurgence in popularity. So just as a quick review to put the, some of the results in context, peak time of effect for MDMA is approximately two to three hours. The physical side effects include jaw teeth grinding, hypothermia, um, as well as increased psychomotor activity, appetite. The board's questions will always say nystagmus, but it's really more opsoclonus, which is to say the involuntary movements go in all directions. The psychological effects are very well known, uh, very well sensationalized in the media, euphoria, enhanced sensation, increased well-being. Rarer complications include serotonin syndrome, hyponatremia, rhabdomyolysis. And MDMA is unique in that there is a 24 to 36 hour grace period between use and when people actually start to experience the come down, otherwise known as colloquially sort of the terrible Tuesdays, uh, that's characterized by irritability, inability to sleep, and some cognitive slowing. Now it's important to note that there was a meta-analysis of sort of the pooled clinical data that's been generated thus far, and they found that in doses of 75 to 125 milligrams, there was really only transient increases in heart rate, blood pressure, and temperature, which is why this is the dosing that's used in clinical practice. The Global Drug Survey is conducted annually to look at the prevalence of use of about 20 substances of abuse, MDMA among them. The most recent iteration, the 2019, was just published recently, and nothing really changed for MDMA. It's still the fourth most used global drug, both lifetime and in the last year. People use about a median of five days a year. Prevalence is highest in the UK and Australia. US is actually sort of a low utilizer. We're in the 20s and 30s. What's more interesting, and this has been an increasingly disturbing trend, is the average pill content has risen exponentially. So the average amount on a day of use of using pressed pills can be over one gram. If using powder or crystals can be in the 300 to 400 milligram range. And finally, about 50% of people never test their pills to see if there's contaminants. The, resurgence, the resurgence of sort of these high intensity pills is directly tied to the rise of the dark net markets. Dark net, deep web, all of those basically refer to websites that you cannot access with a search engine and that you sometimes have to use a special encrypted browser to access the links. In these dark nets, there are forums where you can readily purchase drugs. Um, and one of the recent crackdowns, they found that one of these was based out of LA and it was sending out 1500 packages a month of methamphetamine, opiates, and other illegal drugs. There have been a number of prominent crackdowns on the dark net in recent years. However, these markets are extremely resilient. Uh, the January crackdown that occurred of about 30 closures of forums, the chain analysis website, which looks at cryptocurrencies, as well as these dark net market stability, found that they had already returned to 70% of their peak activity.
As you can see here, there's an individual named Xanax Depot. Uh, apparently has a variety of wares, but here he's selling uh, 11 ecstasy tablets, 190 milligrams each for approximately 0.2 Bitcoin, which is $130, so a little bit of over of $10 a pill. So concurrent sort of with the war on drugs, there was very much an abstinence pro approach to MDMA, particularly in the late 90s, early 2000s. And part of the data that was used in the 1985 Schedule one of the drug was actually unpublished data out of Stanford, uh, including sort of this problematic PET data that NIDA then subsequently used in its abstinence campaign, the one that was sort of infamously the ecstasy will cause holes in your brain. In fact, those holes were actually processing artifact of the PET images by inexperienced um, researchers. As a result, though, it caused a real rift um, between the community and um, the government as to what they had to say about recreational drug use. Now, the neurotoxicity sort of debate continues to rage. Certainly, we know that with high intensity, high chronicity use of MDMA, there are permanent effects on cognition and mood. Uh, the molecular basis of that is from the downregulation of serotonin receptors, uh, lessened ability to bind serotonin. There's some dopaminergic cell death. The mechanism of that is thought to be microglial activation, as well as the production of re uh, reactive oxygenation species. No. <laughs> In regards to mood, there's been a few studies that have shown that certainly motivation for use is definitely a predictor of downstream sort of psychological impact. There have been a few preliminary studies that look at adolescent use uh, possibly being tied with suicide, but these have been very small sample sizes that haven't been replicated. In regards to cognition, there's been two very good meta-analyses that have shown that with high frequency use, there is some small to medium effect sizes impact in terms of cognition, particularly verbal and visual um, learning memory, as well as executive function. However, much of this data is highly confounded uh, for a variety of reasons. First, it doesn't take into account co-ingestion of other illegal drugs, intentional or unintentional, from using sort of contaminated product. It's really hard to judge, the, most of these are retrospective, very hard to judge the chronicity and intensity of use and actually kind of quantify that. Additionally, environment has been found to be very important with hypothermia. A lot of these drugs are used in crowded, hot situations, and that can increase neurotoxicity. And additionally, there's some genetic differences in some of the phase one P450 metabolism enzymes that result in a higher amount of MDMA exposure. As a result of this and sort of the pro-abstinence approach of the war on drugs, there developed really sort of a grassroots efforts among the MDMA users, really all psychoactive substance user community of trying to exchange information in a harm reduction approach. And this was really concurrent with the popularity of the internet in the late 1990s. So a number of forums emerged, Arrowid, Shroomery, um, Dance Safe, and then much later a little bit Blue Light, as well as Reddit, which is newer on the scene but has become very popular. And in this they attempted to exchange information about pills, bad batches of pills that had emerged on the markets, um, as well as ways of using the drug to maximize safety. That included behaviors such as testing pills and certainly Dance Safe, which has a sort of data raver looking pant logo there provided cheap testing kits that could be used on the spot and then also promoting dose reduction such as don't be daft use half which was popular in the UK really trying to minimize exposure and then finally there was this very interesting notion of using vitamins and also other illegal drugs to mitigate the side effects of MDMA, concept known as preloading and postloading now preloading and postloading is existed long before the internet in fact a lot of this was based in the 1970s 80s early literature being beneficial for depression. So the community really seized on to that and started consuming massive amounts of turkey after using MDMA, uh, vitamin C in the form of orange juice as well for free radical um, sort of mitigation, hoping for some neuroprotection. A lot of the time people didn't really know why they were using those drugs. This particular individual said he was taking some ginkgo biloba. He doesn't quite know why, but certainly if you've exposed your brain to MDMA, anything's gonna help and be better, right? Um, what pre-loading and post-loading really is, to summarize it, it is the crowdsource clinical testing of preclinical data and some clinical data, and to put it bluntly. So this has become very popular, very mainstream. This is a advertisement from the White Party two years ago saying, be yourself, let yourself shine, let your serotonin be with you. To somebody who isn't aware, this is just a supplement ad. To the people who are very aware, this is an MDA ad saying, be sure to take your 5-HTP after you roll, otherwise you're not gonna feel very well. So what's involved in preloading and postloading? So preloading is mostly taking drugs, uh, additional vitamins and other drugs during 
and before use in order to minimize um, physical side effects, some psychological side effects. A big one in this is magnesium to help with the jaw clenching and teeth grinding. Additionally, some of these packs have become highly commercialized, so people are, the aim of these is to put them all in one convenient place um, so that it doesn't, I guess, impede the enjoyment of your weekend, although stopping every two to four hours to take more vitamins seems sort of counterintuitive, but anyway. Um, but this particular pack then says, you know, right before use, be sure to load up on all of these neuroprotective agents, uh, N-acetylcysteine, alpha lipolic acid, a little CoQA, um, be sure to bolus all of that before you dehydrate yourself, but that's fine. Um, and then later in the evening, take some melatonin so that your sleep is improved. And then in the days subsequent to use, replete and refresh your brain with 5-HTP. Most of this is derived from neurocognition literature. Very little of this is actually tested preclinically with MDA, MDMA. Some of it is, but very little of it. Certainly no clinical testing in this. A lot of this is anecdotal. The last big study of MDMA's use practices occurred in 2006, so a while ago, in Australia, which is a high utilizer country. They found that about 50% of people were using vitamin supplements to try to mitigate the come down as well as the physical side effects during use. Very little people, or less people, I would rather say, were actually concerned about neurotoxicity and using those agents explicitly for that purpose. What was more concerning, however, was that many individuals were using illegal substances to manage the side effects, other drugs, such as alcohol, ketamine, cannabis, and cocaine, and so forth. Very little prescription drug use. Now, we do know that there's quite a bit of evidence that there are certain substances preclinically, so mouse rat models, that if you combine with them with MDMA, the neurotoxicity is precipitously increased. Those include alcohol, caffeine, ketamine. Um, additionally, we know that combining with certain antidepressants, such as MAOI inhibitors, by case report is a highly lethal combination due to the hypothermia and increased blood pressure. Interestingly, there's a little bit of preclinical evidence that would suggest that cannabis, as well as certain antipsychotics such as olanzapine and clozapine actually have somewhat of a neuroprotective effect in the presence of MDMA and may actually help with hypothermia. That hasn't been studied that much. And the data on the use of SSRIs as a co-ingestion with MDMA is mixed. There were some early reports that said Prozac could be neuroprotective, preventing the uptake of MDMA. However, there were many studies that then later showed as well that by allowing MDMA to sort of linger in the synaptic cleft, it had more mechanisms of action, certainly allowed other sort of metabolites of MDMA to float around uh, a little bit longer as well. So the current survey is the last one was done 13 years ago. As you can already see, a lot has changed in the MDMA community in terms of availability, pill contents, we wanted to look not only at the use patterns of MDMA, but really try to get in and look at the psychological profile of people who are using MDMA, what their motivations are, what the complications they experience from using MDMA is as potential points for harm reduction intervention, and finally also, what are the barriers to people actually talking about this with their provider, if there are any. The UCLA MDMA survey, we launched this. January of 2018, it was an anonymous survey. It was available both online as well as by phone if people felt there were privacy concerns. We used a snowball recruitment method. We contacted the moderators of some of the larger forums, Reddit Blue Light, who very graciously uh, posted invitations in their research section, which they have, um, to recruit individuals to complete the survey. Inclusion criteria were 18 years of age, English proficiency, and at least one lifetime use of MDMA. There was absolutely no compensation provided for this as we had none to give, and the drug was referred to as MDMA, ecstasy, and molly to ensure that there were not subsegments of the population who were missing who had perhaps used this in their earlier years but didn't recognize what the heck molly potentially was. And finally, there was no country exclusions. Unlike prior surveys that looked at high or low utilizer countries, we wanted to try to get as broad of a subsection as possible. Geographically, following pruning out of invalid responses, uh, those with poor effort, we ended up with 404 valid responses. Those spanned across 40 countries, predominantly the United States, but also a fair amount from high utilization countries like the UK and Australia. Within the United States, California, proudly up there on top, um, along with New York, Texas, some of the larger states in their, in their MDMA use. Demographically, there were no surprises, and this was consistent with some of the prior studies. The sample was overwhelmingly young, 18 to 34, primarily Caucasian, 70% uh, male, 30% LGBT, which is actually a little higher, uh, but not unexpected within the MDMA use population. 50% or more of the population had at minimum a college degree, and there was a fair percentage with higher degrees than that. 
86% were employed or students. And the income was actually kind of divided equally in thirds. There was about a third that was below 25K, a uh, third between 25 and 75K, and the rest were above, with certainly a not small segment in the 250,000 to above range. It is a drug of affluence. It has always been a drug of affluence, and that really hasn't changed. We found that overall people reported three median days of use. This was actually absolutely in line with the 2019 GDS survey reported for the United States in terms of median days of use. We found 15 median days of use overall in lifetime, and about 50% said they were using MDMA to one to five years. When I actually did the breakdown of the data, it appeared that there were people who had kind of careers of MDMA use for a period of about five to 10 years, and then dropped off to much more sparse um, utilization after that, with an inverse correlation between age and use that was not unexpected. What was more surprising was that in the 2016 iteration of the survey, friends and dealers were primary sources. Now the dark web is an actual valid contender. Additionally, formula of preference has become powder or crystals. These crystals are sometimes referred to in slang as moon rocks. Uh, they are the post-synthesis, pre-pulverizing form before they're put into press pills. As you can imagine, these are very difficult to quantify how much MDMA one might actually be taking. Um, very high potency. Similar to the GDS, only 50% of people are actually testing their new product to see if there are contaminants. Interestingly, and this was also fair with the GDS, very little MDMA-related ED visits are happening. Uh, of these, though, when we asked people why they were ending up in the ED when they used MDMA, it was primarily panic attacks and anxiety. I don't know that we would routinely in psychiatric um, care and seeing these individuals, if somebody comes in for a panic attack, ask about MDMA use, but it's not, not unreasonable. In terms of the adult turns that were commonly found, amphetamines was obviously the top one, and that's been the case in sort of the lifespan of MDMA. Cocaine, surprisingly low ketamine, um, actually a much more expensive drug, so why it's being used to dilute the MDMA is a little strange. Uh, mescaline um, and some of the other adulterants, there was a report of bath salts as well as some of the synthetic cannabinoids um, such as spice. Another large change is where people are using MDMA. It's no longer exclusively sort of a club use. 41% said they were just using it at home with friends. 35% in a club or party setting. 18% were actually saying they were using it alone, which was a marked change. Reason for use, mostly haven't changed. Euphoria, listening to music, feeling connected, dancing. Uh, however, there was also a fair amount of individuals reporting they were using you specifically to mitigate psychiatric symptoms such as depression or anxiety, and a fair number reporting they use it for therapy. And we had specified whether what kind of therapy this is. This was sort of this form of self-therapy that they were doing alone. And that was prominently in the 18% who were using it alone. 41% of the sample had a prior psychiatric diagnosis. That was a little higher than we initially anticipated, uh, major depressive disorder. NOCD were among the top diagnoses, ADHD, borderline, and then less so for some of the other disorders. Psychotic disorders were less than 1% of the sample. Of the 41% that had a prior diagnosis, only 25% were currently in treatment. And of that 25% in treatment, 15% admitted that they skipped their psychiatric medications to use MDMA. The primary reason for skipping their psychiatric medications was specifically because they feared the use of the psychiatric medications would blunt the effects of their MDMA use. They wanted to have a good role. They didn't feel like their antidepressant was going to help them out with that, so they stopped it for a few days beforehand. Of the total 404 um, sort of cohort, 14% had a history of at least one inpatient psychiatric hospitalization. The rate of inpatient hospitalizations of that amount for actually MDMA-related uses were very low, um, but again, they were primarily for panic, anxiety, and in some cases, paranoia, similar to Dr. Fong's patient. We additionally ask about prevalence of psychiatric symptoms during use. Um, hallucinations and anxiety were relatively common at 25%, much less common as anticipated were depressive symptoms. After use, the majority of patients felt that the MDMA improved their psychiatric symptoms. Very rarely did they feel that it worsened them. Uh, and very rarely were they reporting feeling suicidal after taking MDMA. I think part of this may be explained by sort of this unique relationship between the grace period between use and the actual sort of adverse side effects from use, the emotional side effects, which may break that sort of tethering between association of negative side effects and use, such that people perhaps don't attribute necessarily 
uh, worsening of symptoms because it, temporally it doesn't seem um, connected in their mind, but certainly an area for further exploration. Only 22% of the sample had ever been asked by a mental health provider or a primary care provider if they used MDMA. Those who were asked, however, overwhelmingly felt it was a positive experience. When we looked at the free text responses, I put some of the representative ones here. What made it a positive experience in particular was being able to kind of discuss biological factors about perhaps why they're self-medicating, uh, also having a frank discussion about how to use the drug safely, um, and really understanding some of the factors um, that were going into perhaps frequency and intensity of use. Negative experiences, unsurprisingly, revolve primarily about stigma, uh, fear of legal repercussions. Some individuals, and this came up recurrently, were afraid that they would not receive necessary prescriptions of other medications, such as painkillers, that they admitted to their provider that they used MDMA. And of note, of the entire cohort, 6% considered themselves addicted to MDMA, and none had ever been offered or had sought treatment for that. The motivations for preloading and postloading were very similar to the 2006 survey. The primary motivation is the reduction of emotional discomfort that come down after use. Closely thereafter is to actually enhance uh, the experience itself to increase stimulation quite a bit of focus on using supplements and other drugs to reduce the physical discomfort either during or after. Neurotoxicity yet again comes in at about fourth or fifth as a concern, um, followed by emotional discomfort occur, uh, during, which is more sort of an internal control as that's not necessarily anticipated. The number one harm reduction uh, tool used by people was hydration. Number two was just reducing the frequency of dosing. Number three was actually using preloading, postloading vitamins. Interesting among hydration is that people continue to use water primarily as a tool of harm reduction. MDMA puts individuals in a naturally hyponatremic state, so overuse of water can actually be problematic. It's actually recommended that people use sports drinks intermittently with the water to prevent that from happening. More concerningly is that a lot of people, at least a quarter of the sample, was reporting that they were using high caffeine energy drinks uh, concurrently with MDMA. In regards to the agents that they're using, the old school, the tried and true 5-HTP, magnesium, vitamin C, uh, melatonin at the top still. Very few people using some of the agents that actually have um, clinical and preclinical evidence of neuro, neuroprotection, um, only about 10 to 20% of some of those. The way to read, the, read this chart is that the percentage column is those reporting that they use that agent. Um, the when column is the predominant space of use, either before, during, or after. And the perceived benefits is the top perceived benefit of using that particular agent. 80% of the sample reported that they're mixing MDMA with other illicit substances or other substances of abuse. Mm -hmm. Cannabis was number one among those. Virtually all of the stated co-substances of abuse were specifically with the intention of enhancing stimulation. Save for opiates, which a small percent of the sample indicated they used after use in order to improve physical discomfort. And among these, as you can see, are many of those that have preclinical data indicating high degree of neurotoxicity when combined with MDMA. Prescribed drugs, much more uh, infrequently used, benzodiazepines at the top. Um, some individuals using herbal antidepressants here would mean like a St. John's wort, prescribed antidepressants. The use of Viagra during um, to improve kind of sexual sensation has actually fallen, at least in this subsample, um, compared to prior, prior examinations, probably because there's been a fair amount of education as to the danger of combining the two. In terms of sources of information, friends, dealers are no longer the number one source of information about using MDMA. The internet has surpassed them. Blue Light, Arrowhead, and Reddit are the top three. Some of the older sites kind of falling off a little bit. And certainly, if you want to get a good barometer about really any drug, MDMA or otherwise, these are pretty good forums to check out, very illuminating. Um, these individuals are talking about harm reduction, um, certainly discussing their MDMA experiences, good and bad. Um, and th these can be very, very interesting. In regards to attitudes, uh, people were not terribly concerned about permanent negative um, effects on either their physical body, cognition, or mood. They were even less concerned about the lethality of using MDMA. 
most felt that post-loading was more important than preloading, and overall people felt that using vitamins or other illicit drugs during MDMA enhanced and improved their experience, and additionally not put here, but were very reluctant, reluctant to discontinue the practice, particularly of using other illicit drugs. We then did some regression analysis to look for risk factors of high utilizers, and we defined high utilizers as more than five days of use per year. As you'll recall, that's the median amount from the GDS. So most of our sample was from the United States. We felt this was a fair uh, limitation point, as most of those would be more towards the three ends. What we found was that what was associated with high utilization was using in a party or club setting, using the drug to improve self-confidence or reduce aggression, and then typically combining with stimulants of a variety of types. Uh, including ketamine and amphetamines. Certainly obtaining the MDMA from a dealer or the dark web, and really those are pretty much synonymous as the dealers are obtaining from the dark web who are then, it's just a middleman step. It's all basically coming from the dark web. Additionally, using energy drinks as a primary harm reduction tool, and then rarely testing product uh, was certainly a risk factor. Income of greater than $100,000 was also a risk factor as well as an anxiety diagnosis. This puts together a portrait of an individual that I think we've all seen before, kind of a bro who's using MDMA <laughs> indiscriminately, you know who I'm talking about, uh, that we don't often see kind of with frequency in clinical practice, um, but who are cert certainly there, but I think we see them more sort of towards the, the end point rather than at an intervenable point. In contrast though, the much more intervenable point are those who have high risk for worsening of psychiatric symptoms occurring frequently or almost always. And the risk factors for these are almost a mirror portrait of the patient that Dr. Fong described in the clinical case um, that started this discussion, which is obtaining from a dealer, not testing your product. Both of those are highly intervenable points that come up no matter what risk factor we're looking at. Using for euphoria or a sense of escape, combining with downers such as benzodiazepines, cannabis, certainly presence, and, and some of this is not unexpected, depression diagnosis, history of an inpatient hospitalization, being prescribed sedatives. What's a little more surprising was that there was a high risk if you used quite a bit of preloading and proseloading practices to mitigate emotional side effects after use. So this could be read as individuals who are very tied to the idea and the protection of preloading and postloading strategies, perhaps maybe feeling enabled to use a higher degree of MDMA because they feel they have neuroprotective agents on board. That's one possible explanation. Uh, friends who are sources of info, higher use, certainly students. And finally, 50 to 100 lifetime days of MDMA use was correlated with high frequency of worsening of psychiatric symptoms. So together, we put this information together in sort of a point-by-point -point harm reduction guide. The first point on this, and it's one that I think can't be iterated enough, is just to ask. Ask if people use MDMA. I'm an offender of this as well. It's not routinely on the drugs of abuse that I screen. Um, and I don't think we ask quite often enough. So I think the isolated thing of one individual having an individual problem with MDMA in this room today was probably the result of not, not asking more. That can lead to then a nice sort of segue into a psychoeducation component of the discussion, which is to reiterate the high yield harm reduction points, such as moderating water intake, testing product, which doesn't happen nearly often enough, and really getting into the motivations for use. Um, is it purely to be social? And some of the data showed that the individuals who only use socially with friends, limited amounts, report very, or it's very low, actually lessened risk for worsening of psychiatric symptoms. Additionally, and this isn't intervened enough, and it's a very easy point for intervention, but is to avoid co-ingestion of other illegal substances that are known to increase the neurotoxicity of MDMA, such as ketamine and cocaine and amphetamines, but also caffeine which I don't think we discuss nearly enough with patients uh, and other, particularly those with anxiety disorders. And additionally, one can start to look at perhaps advising patients to start with half, uh, to minimize redosing, which certainly is what is elevating the levels of the kind of overall median use over the day of use. I don't think it's unreasonable at this point, there's fair evidence for the use of magnesium, um, certainly in kind of general non-MDA related teeth grinding and jaw clenching, relatively benign. Um, and certainly you don't want your patient to end up like this individual who was in the British uh, Dental Journal about 
year and a half ago, and there's not nearly enough visceral images in psychiatry presentations, so I had to put this in here, um, who was unaware, and certainly one of the things that MDMA does is cause that sort of disrupted sense of time and space, simply didn't realize they were chewing, virtually chewing through their lip, very literally chewing through their lip, rather. And finally, this really depends on provider comfort as to develop a plan with the patient as to what to do with their psychiatric medications. We know MAOIs, TCAs, absolute contraindications. One could make an argument for SNRIs, Wellbutrin, and that same sort of stimulating sort of antidepressant families that perhaps could cause some discomfort, maybe increased anxiety uh, when using MDMA. Stimulants, for the same reason, certainly to perhaps be held and virtually no risk there. What's more unclear is what to do with mood stabilizers, uh, nephrotoxic, hepatotoxic agents, lithium, Depakote, certainly a risk in discontinuing those for any period of time. Um, at the same time, there's very literal, I will say there is very little case literature of lithium or Depakote uh, toxicity precipitated by MDMA use, but theoretically, it's a highly dehydrating, um, sort of metabolically disrupting event, so the risk is certainly there. And finally, it's to plan. Reemphasize self-care. Melatonin's another agent that's relatively b benign. Preserving sleep will be important in terms of mood symptoms. In the mood and the anxiety clinic, rather, now we very frequently recommend an acetylcysteine. Um, certainly a fair recommendation here, as well as a multivitamin. 5-HTP is really sort of a question mark. Um, the evidence has not been great that in an MDMA-associated um, downregulation of serotonin receptors and binding that this actually you know, increases serotonin rapidly or would have a protective effect. Um, it's certainly an ex more expensive among the agents that are listed there. Uh, so that's really sort of up to the provider as to how much they buy in to 5-HTP. And then certainly um, review the warning signs for serotonin syndrome. Rhabdo is probably one that goes missed more often than not, uh, sort of subclinically because of the amount of psychomotor activity that occurs with MDMA in the setting of dehydration. And then also, as always, have a plan for suicidal ideation. Of note as well with antidepressants, there has been and there was certainly within the survey some indication that keeping the um, antidepressant on board was actually resulting in people having to use higher and higher doses of MDMA in order to overcome the blunting of the effect of the presence of the antidepressant, which may be taken into consideration in thinking about holding uh, the drug for use. So in summary, compared to 2016, quite a lot's changed with MDMA. The dark web is a force that is driving easy access to high intensity formulations of MDMA. Risky, highly preventable co-ingestions are still common. There's increased risk of um, increased use of the drug alone for self-medication purposes. Relatively low rate of emergent psychiatric complications. So the best way to intervene with these patients is not gonna be in the emergency department, it's really in the outpatient setting. There is a high rate of contact as evidenced by prior diagnosis of a mental health diagnosis, but a relatively low rate of discussion. And there's certainly Increased use of neuroprotective agents, but this is definitely something to explore. There's certainly perhaps an anticipatory trend with if the MAPS organization, that's the one sort of nonprofit that's funding much of the clinical trial data in MDMA use, has sort of set a target of 2021 for FDA approval. Uh, we may certainly potentially see an increase in recreational use as a result of that, um, particularly as it becomes better and widely known. And finally, the internet is now the primary source of information. So if you don't talk to your patients about MDMA, Reddit will. <laughs> and, the, so, and thank you. So thank you to... Oh, sorry. So big thank you to Ashley Covington, Dr. Fong, Charles Grobe, who served as the consultant on the survey, certainly the moderators of the forums that help advertise this, and then CTSI, which I do think is an underutilized resource for early investigators who have no money. Uh, they do provide quite a lot of support, and they've um, provided the server accommodation for the survey for over two years, so we're still collecting data um, currently. And then certainly a big thanks to Dr. Fong. He was my first attending on my first day of residency, and, and here I am presenting on the last day, so that's kind of fun. So happy to answer any questions. There's an uh, undoctored photo of Dr. Julio, too, as well, from four years ago. Uh, thanks again uh, for coming out, Dr. Rosenda. A couple of questions I actually have, I, I'm curious, how are people using the moon rocks? What's, how do they take those in? Just ingesting. They just ingest it, or just chip it. 
dissolving or dissolving in liquid. Right. And so yeah. again, the kind of in our mindset when we think about addictions and we think about people using IV formulations, that doesn't happen here. When we think about people being dependent and having urges and cravings, that doesn't happen. And we're talking about use. We're talking about potentially maybe a little bit excessive use, but not even that often. So the traditional models for us in the addiction world, we don't see these people come in. I've never had, in the 20 years I've had here, an outpatient saying, I have a problem controlling my MDMA use. But we've certainly had a lot of folks uh, had that. All right, questions from the audience? Uh, anything? And there's Dr. Brooks there as well. So, any questions? Uh, yes, go ahead. For PTSD, because it's much lower amounts that's being used clinically for PTSD. So 75 to 125 milligrams. The people in clinical settings aren't getting this come down. Okay. So yeah, that's why it kind of reiterated what's actually being used clinically should be very transient sort of physical side effects that go away by the end of the session uh, versus using it five to six times the amount. That's when you start experiencing a lot of the profound physical side effects and then also that come down period. Yeah. yeah. It's such a fascinating world because again, this wasn't the story 20 years ago when you couldn't order these on the internet. You had to literally go into the club and, and buy it with cash and things like that. So uh, I think that idea of people buying it on the internet, buying it for very cheap, and not only just buying MDMA, but buying all these other synthetics that are out there, the DMTs and the various other bath salts. Again, that's why we have to keep up with these trends. All right, any other questions over here? Uh, Dr. Vol, or shall we now call him <laughs> Chief <laughs> Resident yeah. Vol? as you just, <laughs> henceforth shall be known. Yeah, and that, that's exactly the whole point. That's what we led here too, because although she reported using MDMA, we have no idea what she was actually ingesting. And based on this data, there's a high likelihood there were adulterants in there, uh, cocaine, amphetamines, DMT, and various other things. I think, the, again, one of the things, I'm so glad you showed that neuroimaging, because when I was a resident, that was the story of the day, that this stuff was neurotoxic. It blew Swiss cheese holes in your brain if you even just smelled it. And then the data didn't really hold up. But then we would see this clinically bringing the question of, again, when you have self-administration for multiple hundreds of times of an unregulated substance to which you have no idea that's actually in there, and it leaves a physical and psychological scar, that is a matter of public health importance. And so that's where uh, we we're going to highlight. I want to, again, highlight 20 years ago what Dr. Rosenda presented about these, quote, practices of harm reduction would never have been allowed, would never have been say, you can't say these things in a public forum to tell people how to use illegal substances. That's really changed. And now, you know, Reddit doesn't get regulated at all, so the fact that we had to, had to highlight that. But that's why that case is so critical, because it really highlights our need for asking. And I particularly like asking the question, well, tell me about your relationships with substances as an opener. I've even gotten more specific. Tell me about your purchasing experiences with substances from the internet. And instead of saying, do you use Molly? Do you use ice? Do you use crystal meth? That doesn't get you information because now as we see, we have to ask with more specificity, but in a broader way, asking about their relationship with substances. I think that's so important. I think we'll Right here, but uh, we get two in the front here. Do you have any suggestions specifically for those of us who work with adolescents? Good question. I wish we had been. Question is about yeah, specific IRB, for we were, adolescents. We were actually hoping to go younger than 18 for the survey, but it was a whole set of IRB complications. Um, I'd say it's pretty similar, um, maybe perhaps to more of a perspective of trying to avoid use. Um, than using psychoeducation about what we know for like alcohol and some of those other disorders where certainly early use can pattern for anxiety and things like that. So perhaps to avoid a little bit more, but otherwise all the same harm protection yeah. practices hold true. Um, Do you have a specific um, adolescent uh, yeah. population in mind, those who are in treatment, kind of the generic? I, I work with high suicide risk. LA West, West Sider. I mean, it's interesting, last night, 
it's it, it, it's it's a it's definitely for discussion. As an example, last night I was making these slides and reviewing them. Our 13-year-old son, oh, you're doing a talk on Molly? That's ecstasy, right? Right. <laughs> what? How do you know that? And he just kind of walked away. So it goes back to all those things about educating everything about our adolescents, discussion, recognizing that they're not children, recognizing that they're intelligent people who understand it, and they can inform us. I found through the years, pure uh, educational networks seem to be really, really, really interesting. And again, for adolescent therapists and psychiatrists, it's just simply asking. It's not telling, and it's not trying to squeeze information out. It's just asking them in a thoughtful, uh, mature way. So uh, yes, ma'am. it's much higher than we think it is. Certainly when you look through some of the forum data, I've done some pull downs of those just to see what the, because you can extract some demographic data from that. Those, those forums screw you pretty, pretty young. So I think it's, it's pretty high. Um, yeah. And there's a real dearth of even these kind of survey based studies with adolescents to look at, to look at use. Yeah. yeah. And you think about how would an adolescent purchase this? Well, with their smartphone through, and as you see, in uh, evolution to more digital currency, not just Bitcoin's a fancier one, but again, Venmo and Zelle and PayPal and these other uh, things can do it very easily. Uh, credit cards, and as you can transfer over to various things. And in the past, before uh, dark net, they would buy just straight Craigslist. So that was a very popular back about 10 years ago, and it still is, but the dark net and the dark web browsers, if we wanted to order, how fast would it take us to take a computer log on to the dark net and, and order something for delivery. 40 minutes, yeah. 40 minutes yeah. versus, you know, if I wanted to go downtown and buy substances, that's going to take me three hours one way. So I mean, it's a very different world. And again, the call again is for us as educators and providers to continue to get this information out there because fortunately people get overwhelmed by the other larger societal issues, the opiates and the cannabis and everyone talks about alcohol and they forget that even if we're talking about a small five, six, seven percent or even a two percent usage rate among adolescents, that's not zero. And that is a brain that's very, very vulnerable. I think we'll take one more. Do we have one more or we do not? Why don't we go ahead and wrap. Thank you again. We have one more. <laughs> one more. So it's the, the easy tests are just that you put a drop on there with kind of a dropper and it, it turns black and it's not MDMA. They're very sort of crude. Um, some people, they do have some places that will take your product for free and do like high performance liquid chromatography to actually see what's yeah. specifically in there. Um, you can pay for that service as well. Obviously, that's a little bit more expensive. That's why it's probably not as commonly used. And the crude sort of pill testing systems aren't always fantastic either, which is probably why most people feel it's better to get from a reliable source than rely on that sort of data so they just don't bother. Yeah. 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 So you can still purchase these home testing yeah. kits on Amazon yeah. and test for the specific sub presence of that substance, but it doesn't tell you about all the other ones there as well. So take a look at DanceSafe. They're still definitely probably the most organized and well-developed, incredible organization that does these harm reduction policies. All right, with that, we wrap another year of NPI uh, Institute Grand Rounds. Thank you again, Dr. Hell. Thank you, audience. And uh, uh, one last time, thank you, Dr. Grisenda. Thank you, Dr. Fong.